All right, welcome to Rand's Brawl, episode eight. I am here with Tommy Polly and Arlen Harris, former linebacker and running backs for the Rams. This is Derek C. Paula. And today it's all about the linebackers. We promised you some in depth look at the Rams history with linebackers, the position itself, and what it is and why it matters in terms of both this year's upcoming team currently and why it matters in the past. And the man of the hour for this is Tommy Polly. Tommy, how you doing, man? Hey, what's up, Derek? How you doing? I'm do- doing great, doing great. Hey, are you out and about now with the coronavirus thing? Kind of, are you out now? I mean, yeah, I'm out. I'm out and about a little bit. Uh, over here in Illinois, we still want to shut down, so I I can't get my hair cut and stuff like that. But and do all that other stuff. But I'm out and about, just running errands, trying to doing yard work. Stuff like that. Um, just hope, hoping this football uh, get ready, popping soon. I think. I think. I, I talked to my coach today. I, I think uh, maybe in the next week or so, we, we're gonna be able to go out there on the field with the team and um, and get some um, and get some stuff done. So that's that's the stuff I'm waiting for. But up until that point, I just been um, talking to some of my guys that's in college now, uh, that's getting ready for that season, and then also preparing. You know, get my. Uh, Defense ready, looking at my rosters, talking to my coaches, getting ready for the upcoming football season for high school. How's the wife doing? Oh, she's all right. Like I said, she just had the flu. She's good. She's back to work today. So, yeah, we we don't, we don't sit around here. Uh, we got to get back at it. <laughs> well, you mentioned it. You mentioned you're out there doing yard work. So I have to ask, is your lawn like pristine green or what? You've had all this time now at home. Is that lawn looking perfecto? Or? Well, no, I said, man, that's – man. You know, it's been raining out here, so man, it, it get it seemed like it grow every two days or something. So I'm constantly out there doing something. So uh, that's keeping me busy a little bit. Well, Arlen, how are you doing, man? Doing good, doing good. Same thing, just uh, counting the days as we get a little bit closer to uh, you know high school football getting started up. But family's good, everybody's healthy, lawns green, and no complaints. <laughs> lawns green. Also, in this podcast, we're going to have a lawn conversation. How green's your lawn? What do you, what do you put down your lawn? It's a Belorganite. <laughs> Fertilizers. So, you guys know the drill. It is going to be just like last week for the running backs. We're going to get knee deep into it. And for the linebackers, it's the reason why we want to get into both the running backs and now linebackers. These are two positions for the Rams that have big question marks heading into 2020, especially as Tommy put it recently. Middle linebacker, inside linebacker for the Rams, it's a little scary in terms of what they have to do, where they need to come from last year. We saw that middle linebacking core get run over a couple times last year. The car, uh, about the Carl's Cowboys and the Ravens just demolished the Rams at the middle. Tommy, first things first, man. How important is the middle linebacker position in the NFL overall? Well, the middle linebacker is the most, most important thing uh, on the defense, I believe. Uh, he's the quarterback of the defense. Uh, if you have a bad middle of your defense, it could, it, it, it could bring down morale uh, uh, on your team when the team can constantly get, uh, you know, get that push up front and the, and the linebacker's not be able to tackle. So, but the main thing is the leadership. Um, the, he got to be able to uh, get the guys lined up. Everybody got to look for him for the check. And, and then also he got to make plays in the run in the pass. So and he got patrol in the middle of the field. So I mean he has a lot to do. Uh, if you have a weak middle linebacker, um, it, it'll be a long year for you um, because that that leadership void. I mean my first year um, of playing. I mean we had London Fletcher. Uh, it was a great leader, um, one of the all time best leaders it is. Uh, he took me under his wing uh, my, my rookie year. I mean I used to go over to and study film. And, and all those good things. So he and, and he always and also had, held everybody accountable. Not only himself, he practiced hard, he studied film, he worked out hard in the, in the weight room, did a lot of film study, um, and he took care of his body. And, and, and he was competitive. Um, but when things weren't going right, you know, he'd get on you. That's that leadership. So he showed leadership um, by uh, working out, doing things like that. But then also on the field, making sure things are done the right way. Um, Unfortunately, we, uh, we we couldn't keep him, but um, uh, during the duration of my career, I think we'd have had a long uh, a longevity thing here uh, at the linebacker duo, but um, he showed me a lot. He took me on his wing, like I said. So the leadership uh, 
is very important. So is it safe to say that, that when Lennon Fletcher left the Rams, I think you mentioned it last week, that was a dagger for them in terms right. of their future's playoff team? <clears throat> All right, because at least, like I said, then, uh, so my second year we're going to us, so a lot of it wasn't there to hold people accountable day in, day out. Um, so it was a massive void. I mean, we started out the CAs 0 and 5. I can remember it vividly. And um, I didn't get a haircut for like six, them first five weeks. I mean, literally, I didn't do anything. I was just sick in my stomach. So I just said, well, I'm just going to try to feel some, do some things that London did. Because at the time, going into my second year, I, you know, I wasn't really uh, like, Talking, you know, being, you know, being a leader. I was just doing my job, and, and that was it. If somebody messed up or if somebody went practicing hard, I just didn't say anything. I just went on about my business. Um, but I, I noticed, um, I, I, but all the steps along my way, um, I won a lot of championships. Um, like I said before, I won six state championships, four in basketball, two in, in football. I went to four, three or four, played three or four national championships. So winning is. Um, it's, it's confrontation. Um, it's not easy. You like you might lose friends over it. Um, that's why you see so many people crying at the at, at, at the last. You know when they finally win the last game because there's so much heartache going to it. So much you know blood, sweat, and tears, as they say. Um, and sometimes like like we, we looking at the Michael Jordan documentaries reference that. I mean they won a lot. You think everything was peachy and cream, but they had a lot of turmoil about winning. Just wanting to compete. And I think that's what London did. So those first five games, I didn't really do anything. And then I just said, you know what? I'm going to go back to what I know best, what I know back from Northwood, and recreation, to Dunbar High, to Florida State. What I know best was, you know, when things not going by, we got to be confrontational. So we got to get on, you know, our, our teammates a little bit. You know, peer intervention. Damn what the coaches say. A little bit peer intervention. So when, so when somebody makes a mistake, you know, you jump on them. But when London, you know, like I said, when London there, he come in and cuss the whole locker room out. But I don't think Mike had wanted that kind of thing in his locker room. He wanted everything to be easy going. Nobody really say nothing and get the job done. But when you're playing in the NFL, everybody's good every, and, every, and everything counts. So when you got guys like that making guys accountable for whatever uh, mistakes they make, I mean, that's big, especially in the um, – uh, you know, amongst grown men in the in, in the football and national football in pro sports, I mean, not many guys can do that, and, and the other grown guys listen to them and, and, and do it and, and and stay in line. So that I mean, we missed him big time that year. I mean, we went from my first year, we was number one in the NFC in defense, um, number three overall behind Pittsburgh and the Ravens. Um, we went to the Super Bowl. I mean, and then you broke the band up. It, I mean, it just always baffled me. I mean, one day I'm going into the end of the season. I'm thinking we're going to the play. I'm not talking to London. I think I told the story before. I'm like, London, man, they're going to sign you back. He's like, nah, man, I don't think they are. He's, I'm like, what? He's like, he's like, yeah, I think about a million dollars a pot. said, million dollars? Come on now. But I think it was more of the uh, Lovey um, and, and Coach Marks getting like London fiery approach sometimes. And, and he wasn't that guy. He was a dick for a meal guy. And, you know, in this league right here, if it ain't my guy, then, you know, we're going to move on. And that's what they did. I mean, they, you know, we bring a Jamie Duncan after that. And the next season we was on five. So you figure it out. Arlen, you were on the opposite side. I mean, and you came in a year later. So, but you saw that defense that Tommy was on. All from the opposite side of the football, from where you were, how did you view the Rams at middle linebacker, and how does the offense overall view the position of middle linebacker? Well, when, when I came in again, a lot of those guys that was part of the greatest show on turf, you know, Oz, Fledge, Pro, a lot of those guys that were already getting, already leaving or getting picked off or didn't return. So um, coming in the back end, you could just see the face of the defensive changing, you know, as being just a fan and watching. And as far as being in the middle, I know Rob Thomas was one of the guys who talked about Brandon Schiller, two UCLA guys. Jamie Duncan, it was kind of almost like a revolving or like and then like we talked about back by committee. It was almost like linebacker committee for the exception that we had good outside linebackers. You know, TP was there and it was more guys that could make turnovers. That's what I remember was we was a big turnover team. You know, love you hear about the Tampa two and all that stuff. They made plays, you know, had a knee in the background where it was more. I didn't see them as 
one of those guys coming down, not one necessarily come down, would just lay that wood. We didn't have that middle linebacker it was like, don't run in there. We, I, we, we didn't have that. We had more guys. Okay, they're going to be able to cover you. you they're going to strip the ball. They're going to get a knockdown. They're going to get a pick. They're going to be around that football somewhere, somehow, and uh, make, make, you know, make a play and, and uh, be game tackling. But through those years, um, without a doubt, football don't change, man. I, I think middle linebacker is another statement role. Like you said, they're the quarterback of the defense. When you got somebody that's going to hold down the, the middle of the, of the field, per se, like you said, everything starts up front. But anything organic, you got to build it inside out. If you don't have a dog in the middle, that's where, especially as a back, that's where we're looking at, you know, the linebacker core. But if you don't have a dog in the middle, you know, then, you know, our, our run game changes a little bit. You might be more apt to cut something back. You know what I mean? You, you, <laughs> you, you might change the way you press the, the eight, the B gap, just because, you know, you're a little bit comfortable putting your foot in the ground and squeezing it inside. So, some of those little nuances as you get older and you play at that high level, if there's no um, presence in the middle of the football field, it, it can cause a lot of trouble um, when your defense is scheme. Playing off the the whole idea of the running game and the middle linebacker role, Tommy, really going to you on this one. As a fan, most of us, when we think middle linebacker, we think that's your, that is your A, your quarterback out there. He's the one who usually makes the – will call the defensive plays, but he's also the guy who you're looking to to stop the run. That's your run stopper. That's your guy who's going to be able to get in the gap and make the play. How how accurate is that statement in both your era and in today's NFL? And what else is the middle linebacker responsible for? Well, the middle, like I said before, getting everybody lined up uh, is, is his main responsibility. Um, showing the leadership. But, and, and shutting down the middle, but yeah, he, he got to be able to play running the pass. Back back when I was coming in, it was more of a in the box run game. Um, now it's you know you got RPOs, you got outside zone, inside zone. I mean, you got talk, you got everything, and that that middle linebacker got playing space. I mean, it's a lot of times they run the high and low where they got you know they got a uh, they they they, they sending the the bait short and then got somebody deep behind them. Uh, uh, running some sort of and picking on that middle linebacker, what are you going to do? Is he going to jump the short um, short route or stay back and then you know and then rally to the um, and rally to the short route? So it's 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 things like that. You got to be able to play in space. I think that's what happened to Ray towards the end. Um, it wasn't that the Ray couldn't play the run. <laughs> nah, Ray couldn't play the pass. They started uh, uh, isolating him with the tight end or or spreading the, uh, the uh, offense. And then isolating him with a receiver in his own or something like that, or getting it back on him. Um, that that's how the game has changed. Um, I think for me, for myself, um, playing with the Rams, we was more of a a cover two team. You know, as a cover two team, you more of a soft team. Um, coming from Florida State, we was more of a man team. We played downhill. So here, coming here, I always had to be on my heels a lot of bit. So it changed my game up a little bit. Um, which I adapted to, in which we fit our team. Though we was a run team, we was um, a score team. So the cover two works kind of in conjunction with that with that concept. Um, so so I get it um, uh, and things like that. But we always had a kind of weak run defense because we played too high. Anytime you got seven men in the box, I mean you you you're gonna be light. You're gonna be light against the run. So we always had a two gap and things like that. But the middle linebacker, in no, in no sense, he got to know the run in the pass. I mean, probably before it happens. Because um, if he doesn't, I mean, they can play action and throw it over top. So the middle linebacker is big. And like I said, if you I mean, if you don't have one, I mean, I played with two great ones. One Hall of Famer, short five with Ray Lewis, and one maybe with uh, London Fletcher. And, um, and every time I played with those guys, they have one thing, two things uh, uh, that they, they – they, that they both shared, and one and of them was um, um, and those two things were leadership and effort. Like the leadership was in, you know, anybody you talk to about both of them, nobody is in, everybody's going to talk about their leadership, but the effort every day and practice and things like that was um, second to none. One of the interesting things that comes to mind as you guys are describing middle linebackers is after both of you were gone. The Rams drafted Ohio State linebacker James Laurinaitis. And Peter King once wrote that he would be in the Rams' middle for the next 10 years. And 
it was pretty close. He played there eight years. Is the team's leading tackler in history, but he's also been criticized quite a bit. How do you evaluate a player like him who made some plays, made a lot of tackles, but also gets criticized a lot as well? Uh, Arlo, the big man's chopping the bit a little bit. I mean, I, I know, like as far as staying in my lane, I mean, Pisa, Tina Samoa, when we had him, he made a whole bunch of tackles. You know what I'm saying? So just because necessarily, like you said, depending on your scheme and all that, I, I know stats, numbers don't lie, yada, yada, yada. But in the grand scheme of things, you know, Pisa made a lot of tackles, but, uh, you know, we had a great supporting cast. You know what I mean? Sometimes things fall into your lap a little bit this way, and I'm not taking nothing against Larry Nice. You know, I think he had the Ohio State behind him, and he was the sexy pick, and the name sounds good and all that, buzz cut and all that, but I I didn't really see anybody fearing him. You know what I mean? And nobody was running away from him. Nobody in that running game, people weren't just necessarily bouncing and he was the Clayton guys. And I'm not saying it's always about that. I think he had a great career. I think he was a solid guy, you know, just like Witherspoon. They had a couple pieces where at linebacker where, you know, they had a couple guys, you know, their name and they were solid as far as him not being a bust or kind of not really playing to his potential. I think they got out of him what, what he gave. I, I didn't really see him as a franchise type, like, you know, 10, 20 years down the road, we're going to keep saying this guy's name. That that's, that was just me because, you know, I was watching the Big Ten. And um, I don't know his exact weight, um, but he wasn't just a necessarily like a, like a thumper where he was coming downhill and making a lot of co- contact up front. A lot of his tackles was on the edge, on the side of backs, or receivers dropping in the coverage a little bit. So um, I, th- that was my initial, again, I got to go back and watch film and I wasn't at that time watching that much ball with the Rams during this time, but um not many people were to be honest with you. I mean let's you see. know, so that I mean that should tell you a lot, you know, with, with within itself. But um I mean for sure he was solid. Like you said he got eight, you know, wasn't too far off from the ten, but I think at, at that time, you know, during that regime, man, I think they were looking past those teams, man. They were they were planning for the future anyway. All right, Tommy. What are your thoughts? I mean, he put up numbers like you know, like he said, um, but they wasn't they was in meaningless games. That's what I would like to say. Like probably when teams were playing the Rams, they was gonna sit out the best guys. I mean, your intensity in practice probably wasn't that high and things like that. So he made a lot of play. I'm not gonna discredit them. I wasn't a big Lionitis fan just because I mean I mean, I mean, if you play football, you can put up a bunch of numbers out there. At that, at that time, you're playing a lot of defensive plays because your, your defense not really that good, so you want to field a whole bunch. It's, I mean, so if you play eighty snaps, eighty. If you play eighty snaps or more a game, or you somewhere around there, I mean, you you supposed to make twelve, fifteen tackles a game or more. Uh, but at, in the grand scheme of things, I mean. Does it really mean anything? So, and, and the, is the other team giving the max effort? I, I mean, I would like to say the guys. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna name a little later, or, or even when I played. Um, I mean, we was coming there getting the team best shot every week. They was trying to take our heads off. We was they was trying to run the ball down our throats uh, to keep the offense off the field. So we was getting their best run scheme. I mean, so. Uh, those guys put up numbers, like I said, uh, Witherspoon, Ogletree, um, and I, I mean, I, and I got some of those guys on the list. But at the end of the day, they play for losing teams. They play in a lot of meaningless games. But I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, we, we forgot all about it. I think the one thing that I remember, and remember, I'm an Ohio State fan, so I mean, I was watching him play when I was going to Ohio State. Guess I went to Ohio State late. I was watching him go all the way through, and I actually have a Laurinaitis jersey. The only uh, Rams St. Louis colors jersey I have, by the way. I I think in the end, looking back over the years, I would say that he was he should be, there should have been more. If you were going to go get a guy to, to man the middle of your defense for a decade, you need that person to do more. And I think you nailed it in the head. 
yeah, you got all these numbers, these tackles, but what about the, the tackles that matter behind the line of scrimmage? About, um, you know, pressure plays in big game plays. I mean, I, I can't say that about Lauren throughout his career. I, I, he was just there. Had 10, 12 tackles a game. And, but like I, Arlen, you th- I thought you nailed it. You remember it well. He was oftentimes a sideline or down the field. I can't deny that at all. I wish it was different. G- going back to the current Rams now. The Rams have questions of middle linebacker. And this is a middle linebacker cord that is going to face a four-air running attack, a Seahawks running attack, and a much improved Arizona Cardinals team. I'm going to stick with I'm going to stick with uh, with Tommy on this one. How do you feel about the current Rams middle linebacker core? What can they accomplish in 2020? Like, how much do you believe this team will be different from last year on the inside? Uh, well, they're a little thicker. Littleton last year was a smaller linebacker. Um, more of my, my, my type, more of my, how I was as a linebacker, a little light, sideline to sideline, playing space type of linebacker. These linebackers you got now are, are you know, more down here, thumper, 245 type, which was, which is needed for this conference. Because, you know, Seattle, I mean, they just loading up on backs. They got two backs hurt. They got three backs look like they just signed. Um, San Fran had a bunch of backs, got a nice uh, old line, uh, and, and they're going to be physical. Uh, so uh, that's why I see them more than anything. Their backs, I mean, their linebackers this year, 245 in that range. So they're thumpers. And, and you know, old Wahoo, uh, the old Baltimore guy, <laughs> he used to make a lot of plays uh, all over the field. He just got to stay healthy. But the main thing, they're just unproven. So I think they're not going to be fooled uh, by um, what San Fran and Seattle is trying to do. Um, they're they're going to be downhill guys trying to run, uh, teams trying to run right at you and see what you're made of. And all you just got to really do is make tackles. It's not a back in the co- in, in the division where I say, like, whoa, that back right there is. No, they got regular backs in the division. It's a lot of them. The offensive lines are pretty good. The OCs are pretty good. The physical teams with the mentality, uh, what they're trying to do. Um, so all they got to do is just play fundamentals, come down here and make tackles. That's it. There's no – like last year you can make an excuse because you had two light linebackers in the middle. Or Rita, uh, who I didn't think was, you know, all that all that good. But now you got down here guys that can dunk. So, yeah, I, I like them a little better to hold up against the run. And they used to make them plays. So, our, let's see what names you recognize here that are listed more towards the inside. You ready, Arlen? Yep, let's do it. Okay, you recognize him. Daniel Batuli. What? Traven Howard. Yeah, he played a little bit last year. He'd be a third down. He might get some reps. Clay Johnston. Special teams guy. He'll be a he'll be a he'll be a headbanger. He, he got football IQ. You'd be surprised. He might get in that line of that wild who don't do something. I'm just I'm just looking to see Arlen's if, if Arlen's recognizing these names though, you know. Yeah, you put, <laughs> you put me on black. You put me on black. See, no, this it's, it's, cool, it's not huh? meant to. I just No, no. No. It just go back with my conversation about when I'm a linebacker and I look in the backfield and I see we're running back at it. It ain't 28. Hey, these are some guys, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's. I. This is not in any way meant to put you on blast. This is, and this is real deal stuff. You're Micah Kaiser. Yeah. Recognize that name? I know. I, I know that name. I heard that. Brian. Yeah. Brian London the second. He threw the second in there. Brian. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Troy Reader. You meant. Tommy just mentioned him. Troy Reader. Christian Roseboom. And Kenny no, Young, third year from UCLA. So they, they got Kenny Young from the Ravens. Kenny Young should stop. All of them should be in the fight. Him, Mike Kaiser, Johnson, and Howard. All right, so Arlen, hearing all those names right now, and let's say, let's put you in 
the role of the starting running back for the San Francisco 49ers. How are you feeling? I'm feeling phenomenal because I'm running behind that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running. <laughs> I'm running behind that old line. I'm feeling and, great. But no one's scaring you on that Rams linebacking court. <laughs> East in the middle? Nah, you know, and I don't want to disrespect. I mean, it's the, like, but yeah, between high hey, and high line, it's, there, there's no name, you know what I mean? But like you said, like, TP hitting it, there, there's nobody proven. I don't overlook nobody, but between that offensive line and how we was able to handle the past couple of years, I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling very optimistic. All right, so flipping it back around to you, Tommy. Well, what's the D-line look like? Well, the D-line's a little bit of a different story. The D-line's solid with the run. You got Aaron Donald there. You have the, you have the dude from Detroit they picked up who's a run stuffer. You got Michael Brockers back. I mean, that's that's nice to have. So all that in mind for and, you and with that, that veteran defensive line, if you were coaching up these, these linebackers, what are you, where are you taking them? No, all you got to say is A-D and that's it. Just, just say Aaron Donald and then just stop. That's this, that's as it. a linebacker. One thing as a linebacker, Doc, I played on. You know, if, if those guys up front gonna eat up double teams, all you gotta do is run and make tackles. It's just the easiest job in the world. They have big backs. I mean, big linebackers, so they should be able to come down here, make a thump, and thump you. Well, last year. Little Tim was a little undersized, and Howard would come in, and Reader is probably was overwhelmed by the speed. I think this year they got guys that's running four six, four seven range, two forty five. All they got to do is run and make tackles. I mean, come on now, come on. I mean, Little Tim played goddamn good. Little thirty two million dollars, whatever he made, he got big money. So it ain't like he had a bad year. He just was out of position. Well, Kaiser and Reuter, Reuter are the only two people who are near 245. Just want to point that out. And Young. Young. Young's a 234. <laughs> hey, you're, you, you're the one who was putting the focus on that 245 number. That's, that's fine. 235 is 240-ish range. Okay. Right. What, what Littleton was? What was Littleton? Oh my goodness! I don't even remember now. He was I. I, I can't look. remember. He was, two, 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 was just five. so fast. Hey. Just what you're thinking about. Hey, and, and Derek, you know, after year two, they don't really they change your picture, but they're not really messing with your measurement like that. So they could All be right. two fifty or two thirty. Them dudes mess around be two fifty. They comfortable right now. He's about two twenty five. Yeah, two twenty eight. Yeah, that's about right. But that's still like a. A weak side linebacker ish. But no. you can play the mic. They actually the Rams played better defense last year than they did than they did the year they went to the Super Bowl. They did, and that was the you frustrating part though. Little? I mean, for a good chunk of the year they were in the top ten against the run, but then they wet the bed against the Cowboys and, and the Ravens. And that's to me, those two games are what got Wade Phillips dismissed. There's no way you're supposed to get rid of Ray Filler, first of all. I think that's the travesty in itself. You had a better defense than the year you went to the Super Bowl, and you get rid of this guy. This guy won an all-time bet. But that's for nah, that's not for here nor that. I mean, he's a proven guy. The defense played well. I think with the Raven, I think with the Ravens thing, it was more of a scheme. You gotta be more of a uh, uh that is more on the defensive coordinator because you gotta be more uh sound. With your fundamentals on on defense against that scheme that the Ravens doing, and and, and um and the Cowboys where they played the, and the Cowboys just a downhill running team they had a good O line, I mean they had a bad night, but overall playing in that division against San Fran and Seattle every week and they held up against those guys. I mean come on. I mean I'm not criticizing right now. I'm I'm just asking the question. I'm I'm thinking if I, if I'm gonna look at two games where. As a guy who, who knows defense, I mean, I coach it too. Not like you guys know it, but I saw a team that did not adjust well in those games, did not really game plan well, but it, it's two really good teams around the football. I, I agree. I agree. I said the Ravens. I said and, the Ravens was a game plan thing. He didn't. That wasn't. No, he messed up. At that and don't fit the Bucs game, too. Fire yourself in, but do the, coach, do the coach fire himself when he had a bad Super Bowl? No. 
Oh, no. no but you well, I mean, remember, the storyline the story was... <laughs> the storyline was that McVay wanted somebody who was more scheme-based, able to okay. adjust more to the scheme in-game compared to someone who focused more on fundamentals. Now, that was the reports we saw. That's not even something that's been verified. I can see that with the read option stuff. There's a lot of that going on. And if you don't know, if he's not adjusting to that, um, I guess the Ravens, a lot of more teams do that. But how, how, how did the defense play against San Fran and NC? Very well. Yeah. So, Harlan, like I said, you, when you, you talk play about those Ravens, teams out man. of conference, yeah. Like you so, like the yeah Ravens, when you play teams out of conference, that's, that's, that's tough. Right, everybody. And you got an MVP like we're talking about Lamar Jackson, like the like the Vicks. There's very few people come through like he does. And man, I don't care what scheme you got, he's gonna. That's very hard to defend, man. Very, very hard to defend. Defend, and they were unique in their in their offensive scheme. Nobody would look like them in the whole NFL. And you're gonna hang your hat on that. And ain't like right. they had no. It ain't like Lamar had. First of all, if you held the corner, he's fast enough to run around you and, and run out of bounds and get it first or at least five yards. He's that quick. Then you've got two running backs that can carry the load, and you got tight ends that you can be accounted for. So when they went laterally with that line of scrimmage, you overrun that thing if you want to. Come on, man. That was uh, that's that's rough. I didn't see anybody until uh, who was it? Uh, Kansas City or whatever. They just kind of. You know, some things kind of. Well, no, the next week. The The next week, the the 49ers gave him the game, remember? Tight end, go out and they run the ball. The next week, the 49ers gave him the game. It's not like like the the Ravens were unbeatable. But when you're going on Monday Night Football, on national TV, your playoff hopes are hanging in the balance. And you just get destroyed. By a team that you at least on paper should be competing with, not necessarily beating. I'm not saying that, but should be competing. That you can see how the criticism towards the Rams after that game would have been at least somewhat justified. I get what you're saying. Well, hey, you know this is a, a defense, that, an offense, that a lot of people had a hard time stopping. But this this was the this is a Rams defense that, like you guys were just saying, was pretty good this year. All of a sudden, we're going to say, well, we got this, this, and this, and it's kind of like you're going against your own point. Nah, man, that's a totally like. Even I, I remember I saw part of that game with the with the Forty ers That was an individual. That wasn't even so much a collective effort. Lamar was Lamar had a bad game, and you can say, "Oh, well, I don't want to hear all that." That's just one person. He runs the show. He was in the like, That's his thing. He's still growing. Wasn't man? He was making terrible decisions. I think he turned because he wasn't really turning the ball over. I think how I many didn't he turn the ball over against San Fran? Well, anyway, I know, I know it was a pivotal point, and, and that had him flustered because he was doing things. He was kind of – it was out of character, and I think it started to snowball. But we're not going to sit here – like, he's an X-factor guy. Like, he ain't just uh, – like, he's in his own box. Like, when Vic came through, Steve Young's like, you can't sit there and just like, well, no, nah, this is a good offense. You can't nah, – not he's – he's a nightmare for defensive coordinators because yeah. you don't know – what you when you what you're gonna see week to week because they have those options. You go double tight and you're running the option. Come on, man! You go double tight play action. Your tight end is sla- is smashing down and they will leak him out for a linebacker. If you got read keys and you see okay that tight end just went down and double team. My eyes go now to number two or number three, whatever however they do it, and then that tight end disappears and sneaks out. Like you can't. That's what I'm saying. Like the Ravens had a good, and then eventually, because you're at the level we're playing, people are going to adjust. You know what I mean? And I mean, come on now, we getting paid. The defensive coordinator is going to adjust and say week to week they got the tendencies. But in my opinion, that just makes it longer to prepare because they're showing you so much. Man, they can spread out. They went three by one, two by one. Tight ends in the backfield as a fullback. They double tight. They just went unbalanced. Now Ingram is just like, man, they gave you so much to think about. And, oh, by the way, if things break down, that dude holding the ball can't go 90 at any time? Come on. That's, that's, that's rough. 
that's rough in my opinion. That's that's hard to you can't game plan for that. What's the game plan for speed and elusiveness? Like you can't What's the Lamar game plan for it. it. It's a, it's a game plan for it. This is a game plan for it. Well, how did you game plan for it? Well, you had to hit him. What was everybody saying in the playoffs? But they say you once Lamar has not been hit yet. That was everybody's right. thing. I don't want to hear all that. Oh man, we're gonna bracket him and I okay, you might no, you might eliminate the forties and twenties. <laughs> he's still getting the first down and he's making it look like he's still in high school. He's moving the football, but now you gotta make him throw or you better hit him. That that was the only way you're gonna slow that boy down. Man, hit him you, or make him throw. You put everybody in the box, you put everybody in the box, you man them you receivers up on the outside, you make him throw outside, bro, because he can't throw the ball outside. And you and you and you put everybody in the middle where he can't make them quick passes to the tight end. You play assignment football, so everybody the DN know what he's doing, the linebackers know what they're doing, and then you go from there. But he still can't make them outside throws consistently. Now, once he start doing them out, them deep outs, and them comebacks, oh, it's a wrap then. Oh, yeah, it's a wrap because there ain't really nothing you can do. And they don't have a receiver like that where you gotta show respect to. Like, well, I got a shade over him. I mean, Hollywood and them nice, but, you know, you get in the playoffs, you're going to get a, a corner, all right, you stay on him. You know, they ain't really got that guy. So he can't throw outside, and, and they don't have a receiver. So, but but what the Ravens didn't do, I mean, what the Rams didn't do, but Wade Phillips didn't do, he didn't play assignment football. You got to play assignment football against the Ravens. If you don't, and you got to play a little question. You know, zero, little zero. Well, man, a lot of man to man, uh, assignment football, downhill, making them throw the ball outside. If you don't do that, then – and if McVay said he didn't think he could be able to make adjustments, okay, I, I feel him on that. But, I mean, Murray Phillips, I mean, he's been coaching for a long time. He's been having a lot of – he had a lot of great defenses. But um, if he probably just wanted to go in a different direction, I probably – I'd probably just stay pat. But, hey, that's why I'm over here sitting at home and they controlling the uh, Fortune 500 company. <laughs> so, looking overall – and this is something we were talking about before the show – and I'm kind of going back and forth, iffy, and you know, I'm I don't really, I'm not real keen on the, you know, like there's some franchises that you know they've had their middle linebackers, like they've had their statement middle linebackers, and for the Rams it's a little bit harder for me to figure out. For me, in some cases I lean more towards Leonard Flex, even though he's only there for four years. There's you know Hacksaw Reynolds. I guess I want to ask you guys, who is the best Rams middle linebacker in the franchise's history? Arlen, you want to go first? Who go? I go first since he went first into the running back. So I don't want <laughs> I'm laughing because I, I had to do a little homework. I had to do a little homework. But I had to dig I had to, I had to dig a little deep. But what was impressive to me, and I don't I'm not gonna sit here and perpetrate because I wasn't born yet, but I seen him. But I'm gonna go with the Isaiah Roberson. I don't know if you saw Tim P T P but he was number ten pick. He made he made the Pro Bowl as a rookie. He was defensive player of the year. I think he made the Pro Bowl at least eight times. His stats was phenomenal. Um, I think as far as I don't know, he he wasn't middle. I know he flirted with a little bit. He was more of an outside linebacker, so I'm cheating a little bit. But I think um, even when you went into top 75 Rams of all time, he was the first linebacker name. So that's what made me really do my homework because that ain't if the people are saying that, or I don't know if they voted it or you know what that was. But then after that, you start filtering through and you see your, you know, your, your, your London Fletchers. I know you mentioned Jack Reynolds earlier. Um, again, that's another 70s, 80s. You know what I mean? But that's, a, that's, that's before my time. But at present day, I, I remember the legend, the London Fletchers of the world. And I don't want to, you know, you see your Laronitis and all that. But I do think London Fletcher, because of the Super Bowl appearances and what he was able to do and, um, he didn't really get the accolades and attention that he deserved in a league level or nationwide, but I know he won a lot of uh, in-house awards. And you see the way, you know, 52 talks about him. And you can go talk to any of the guys that made that run on the greatest show on turf. They're going to back up and they're going to talk about Fletch. So in, that, in, my, in, in my opinion, that holds a lot of weight um, to me when you actually have the players, not just on the Rams, you, you ask guys in the conference or outside that, they gonna bring up Fletch name because I remember I didn't play with them at the Rams, but I know man, shoot, people ask me, man, who when was the hardest hits? Adrian Peterson, the safety at the Cardinals, and London Fletcher when he was with the Bills. 
And so he he sticks out to me. He brought that thing thing, and I and that's that's one of the things that I remember uh, about him. So inside, I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna say Fletch because that's what I really know. But I think um, Isaiah Roberson, Jack Reynolds, and a couple other guys that came through um, that should be mentioned as well. As far as top who you would who you would think as far as accolades and, and being historical in the Rams franchise. Tommy, that's a great pick. That's a great pick. Isaiah, them numbers is is unbelievable. I mean, I ain't gonna lie. Like to come in as a rookie and be all pro. I mean. Six. I mean, that's ah, that. He he's tough, but I'm gonna go with uh, mm, Isaiah bro. Mm. He might. I I have never seen him play, but looking at his stats and all that, and the high type of player, he, he probably was remind me of myself. I, I'm a weak side linebacker, just want to make plays all the time. But let's Rick. Let's Rickner. Uh, he was the eight time Pro Bowler, two time All Pro, um, two time. A uh, three-time second-team All-Pro, and he's a Hall of Famer. So uh, Isaiah Robinson didn't make the Hall of Fame. So I can't take fame. anybody. He should be with them numbers right there. <laughs> she should be good. But hey, so I'm gonna go with the Hall of Famer. Just I mean, you, 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 I never seen him play, uh, but you, you see his numbers. Um, obviously, made the Hall of Fame. And then I'm gonna go with um, not he's he wasn't an inside linebacker. But uh, but he he went in as a linebacker. We're gonna go with Kevin Green as number two because he's a Hall of Famer. Um, and then Jack Reynolds, um, number three. But my number one, you know, my favorite is London Fletcher. Um, but here he didn't make the Pro Bowl. Uh, he always was a little short. I think it was more perception versus reality. You know, when you had the greatest show on turf, and at the time we played in the Western Division where defense wasn't. It wasn't what it. It wasn't what the the the, the what the division is known for today. Back then, it was more of an offensive division uh, with Hasselbeck, Hasselbeck, uh, uh, Hogan um, was the, uh, the uh, head coach of Seattle. And then Coach Martz, and then San Fran ha- had a, a good offense with T uh, O and Garcia and things like that. So it was more of an offensive division. So London didn't get his just due. He didn't make any Pro Bowls with the Rams, but, you know, he wound up being a Pro Bowl player once he left the Rams and things like that. But we all know what type of leader he was. He should have made the Pro Bowls. It, it just was a perception. Um, like I said, the Rams wasn't known for, with a, for a great defense. Um, but Isaiah Robinson, oh, man, like, that's – just looking at him, he should be in the Hall of Fame. I, <laughs> just looking at him, like, why why isn't he in the Hall of Fame? It's amazing why why he's not. Um he took like 20 sacks, 20 mm-hmm. interceptions. Like, that's – yeah, either he's a bad boy. I didn't even go to look at deep. I just went on his, you know, his main accolades. And, and I mean, those are impressive. So, uh, I want to bring a couple things pro- in there, too. Pro- yeah. And that yeah. is – is hey, I want to give props to Tommy here because, you know, for all the players I've studied, I got to be honest, Les Richter, he – Pretty much always slips someone's mind. Slips my mind when you talk about the greats in the team's history. When he went in the Hall of Fame in 2011, Les, what did he do? And then you go back and you look at what he did. And you're like, oh my gosh, Les Richter right. was, you know, when you actually dig into who he was, he was amazing. And it's a shame, by the way, that he died before he was inducted. He died in 2010, Great. inducted in 2011. You know, and I, Isaiah Robinson. Robertson, what people, I think, don't realize about the Rams' defense of that day, because of their defensive line, those linebackers are kind of forgot during the 70s. Between the 60s and 70s, the Rams Sexy basically moved from, the, yeah, moved from the Fearsome Foursome version 1 to the updated Fearsome Foursome with Jack Youngblood in the line. So what he did behind the line, linebacker, whether it's off outside linebacker or middle linebacker, he did tend to rove a little bit. Uh, he it was phenomenal, and he, he's one of those guys who has been forgotten when it comes to Hall of Fame talk. And I, I and this, I've had this conversation in Rams Talk Radio too. There are a lot of Rams due to the Rams' failures, I think, to win titles due to the constant relocation of the franchise, who've been left behind when it comes to Hall of Fame. I could talk any matter, you know, Isaiah Robertson. There are several players. On 
this team's all-time roster who should at least be talked about for the Hall of Fame that aren't. And that's a shame. And that's a shame. Yeah, no, I no, I no, I agree. Um, but now you put it in that context, like I said, you know, perception versus reality plays out. Um, they probably he, they didn't look at him as a great player because he probably played with those great lines. But you know, he was a great player. I mean, he do all that. I mean, it's just amazing how you know get in. But another guy had, you know, I got up that guy, um, Van Nidus. You know, he's up there. He's all time ramp tackler. But like I said, they weren't really, really those tackles really didn't mean anything. Um, but he is the all time franchise tackle leader. You can't you can't just put that aside when you are. Uh, Professional football with all these great these players that we just named, and you're the all time tackler. You got to put them, you got to give them some props. And then I'm going to pair um, Alex Ogletree. Uh, he has some pretty good seasons. But then again, like, like I said, again, uh, huh? So he why, didn't, why? yeah, he just didn't, you know, they, they didn't win a lot of games. So like, I go back to, it was like my Niners numbers. So he didn't he live up to his potential. That, he, he made a lot of plays to me. He made some plays, but he was also a guy who they drafted to, to be someone tough from the middle, but yet he couldn't penetrate offensive lines. He couldn't move. I mean, he would, he was great to the sideline. Like, I always argue they should have put Ogletree on the outside. They never did. They tried to put him in the middle. And then when they, they treat him the Giants, what they try and do, they put him in the middle. Well, go, okay, fine. For Laurinaitis, he did have a couple really good years. I mean, there were a couple of really good years early in his career that you could tell if he if things panned out right, he was going to have a great career. But you know, you said it. That defense is on the field a lot, a lot, and you put mileage on people enough. Anybody wears out. I think. I think with both men, we never saw them reach their potential in the NFL, or what they could have been, and that's why it's kind of hard to talk about them on the upper levels of Rams history in terms of linebackers, even with with uh, Lauren Nice's tackle number. And then, and then, well, even with myself, um, you know, I put myself in there. I don't care. You know, I, I always, I'm always an advocate of myself. Um, I made the all rookie team. No, hey, I'm just a confident yeah, guy. I wouldn't have got the way I would. I wouldn't have got the way I got it. You, you, you feel me? So, all rookie team. Um, so the guy, I got defensive rookie of the year votes. I was the fourth, fourth guy to get picked in, in the draft, and still got the team votes. You see that trophy back there? Yeah, that right there. Three other guys that went before me. Remember that. And then, you know, I got, I made the all decade team for the Rams while I was there. Staying on those Rams all decade team. I ain't got to go to my other numbers, even though I made 100 tackles three out of four years I was here. But when you make the all, te- all decade team, I mean, I mean, that says something in itself. So I'm going to put myself in there. You don't need to be an advocate. It's yourself. I love me some me, like T.O. said. <laughs> right. Okay, so Arlen, I'm going to bounce back to you. Any any final thoughts on that? Or anything you want to add in? Nah, I, I second everything that he said. And um, you know, since we co-host, I, I think I think even Tommy Stone himself, I, I think he's one of the few guys that everybody we mentioned that he could still be playing today because of the way you know the way he's built and the way he played. You know, he played that physical game, and you know he was able to cover. And I think, you know, Tommy walk up on that on that D-line, walk up on that edge, he was able to get some things done. So, it, I don't know. It, I, it, it's interesting, you know, you you to think about only a handful of guys and you think linebackers and the Rams, um, that's unfortunate because when you – when you, that that's one of the most powerful positions, in my opinion, in the sport. And um, when you got to dig that deep and got to really do research, and I'm talking you going back, geez, over 20-something years – just to find some legitimate middle linebacker and who really made that type of impact, you know, we got to, we got to be able to change that moving forward. But I got a couple more guys. You got Maxi Bond, um, mm-hmm. played five years for the Rams, four pro bowls. Um, and Roman Pfeiffer. I mean, he played a lot of years here. Again, he played in the era where he played a lot of plays. They didn't win a lot of games. So the plays didn't mean nothing, but he made two pro bowls. Um, so I gotta give him a shout out. Uh, he played well, and then actually, I think he was on the team that beat us in the Super Bowl. He won a couple Super Bowls after he left here. Okay, so those are great names to have. What about the NFL overall? 
best linebackers in NFL history. I know you guys got a couple of them. Marlon, who's on your list? Well, I'm a my number one. Remember, I said I was indecisive with the running backs. My number one, Jack Lamb. I'm going back to PA for that one. I know everybody talked about Dick Buckus, but Jack played in four Super Bowls. He made nine Pro Bowls to Dick's eight. You know what I mean? So I'm going with Jack. I'm going with Jack Lambert as the number one guy. Then you know Dick Buckus and and Ray Lewis as my top as my top three as far as being in the conversation now. As much as I love Ray, I know Ray's a rah rah guy. Now, when you watch him in his prime, he he had a lot of help. That defense, he had a lot of help. And something I'll never forget, and I forget what draft year it was, but when they lost Sarah Goosa and Ray was up for either extension of his contract or whatever it was, and he was kicking and scratching and screaming to make sure they got that boy out of Hawaii or wherever he was because he knew he was getting older, number one, and Ray – is at his best when he can be covered up. If you can let lead him get them guards off of Ray, and he can go sideline to sideline, that's a bad boy. But when you publicize that, though, when you make that known to everybody, hey, I want you to go pick dude so he can d- be double team and replace Sarah Goosa. He kind of lo- he kind of lost a couple points for me in his goon. He he lost no. maybe a little bit of points when he made that when he made uh-huh. that public because it made me look no at coach. film and look him at a different light. So Ray needed help, man. Ray needed to be covered up. You take because now yeah. if you go back and watch yeah. this heyday, you remove you remove Sarah Goosa. Are we still yeah. talking about Ray like this? Yeah, stop. Take Sarah yeah, Goosa out the middle. I, I don't still know doing what Ray doing. I don't know. Like Mike Singletary, one. take the whole bad defense off. Jack Lambert, take the steel curtain out. Take take the steel curtain out, Jack Lambert. Don't have them no. guys and stop. But he didn't come out and say he needed to be protected like that. That's a different ball game back then. Jack was coming down there, no teeth and all, kissing people in the mouth. Man, man them guys Ray, been that. Them guys was going to be there ten years. They had him in the contract ten straight years. They couldn't go nowhere. Come on, man. Nah, Ray, Ray separated himself because his sideline to sideline. Phenomenal. He was a phenomenal line back in the middle. Ray, what impressed me was he wasn't just making them a gap tackles. Ray was coming to get you. That's that's what was separating for me to Ray. That's my take. Tommy, I'm a linebacker, but he's number three. Tommy, I I'm gonna I'm <laughs> shutting up here, man. I got nothing on this one. I'm thoughts, Tommy. Where are you going with this? Listen, I when back in my day, the middle linebacker was like equivalent to the quarterback what he is today. Would, would you would you say that right? Like back in the day, like the middle linebacker was the guy. So I'm gonna go with the you know the old guys. You got Ray Nisky and Jack Ham and Ted Hendricks and Dick Buckus and Jack Lambert. I'm not you know they was great linebackers in that era. But the new era, who I feel is the number one linebacker overall. Come on, man, is Ray Lewis. And it's a couple guys that's close. Mike Singletary close. This is Ray Lewis and man, I grew up on Mike Singletary uh, with the bass, with the eyes and all that. And, and reason why those two, I I, I want to say them first because they're like again their leadership and their effort was second to none. When you think about those guys, you think of leadership. When you think about those guys, you think of effort. Those guys won championships, defensive players of the years. They played on great defense, number one overall, best of all time. You see Ray Lewis and Mike Singleton. You know what they got in common? Probably one of the top two defenses in the history of the NFL. That don't happen with. Some duck in the middle, that don't happen. You you gotta have some studs in the middle, and they led that those two defenses, two great defensive all time. Just so happened Ray Lewis and Mike Singletary was on them in, in, at the middle. Come on now, that that means something. Yeah. But my but, but, so, but my favorite, but my favorite overall. I mean, so Ray Lewis, Mike Singletary, the middle. My favorite personally is Derrick Brooks. You know that's why I went to Florida State, the outside linebacker. Defensive player of the year, won a Super Bowl, gang of accolades, better person than he is a player, but the but a goddamn great player. So those are my top three. Um, but what you was about to say, Arlen? What, what you was about to ask? I, no, I'm, I, I get the whole thing, but like you said, I, I, clearly the linebackers, you know, just like the running backs, they're going to say, well, I'm nothing without my line. You know, you're going to make that spiel, and, and it's rightfully so. But I just don't see Jack. I just don't see Jack and Dick running up into the front office 
tell him that who they need to pick so he can still be able to get his rocks off. You think they wasn't doing that? Come on, man, stop. Get out of here. Yeah. You yeah, have them to dudes, them dudes, them, you them dudes mean, built you different mean, back Joe, then. You ain't Joe Green in the buff front. You ain't Hall of Famer. You play the front. You play the front of four Hall of Famers. <clears throat> Just want to point this out too. Four Hall of Famers. This yeah, one point Ravens, this out. That, that Ravens defense was stacked too. Now, okay, this one point this out. Stacked. That pretty much that entire Pittsburgh roster was loaded on Roy's the whole time. Let's not forget that. Oh, I, ain't I mean, even just want to throw that out there. I, I uh, ain't even go there. I mean, I'm not afraid to go there. there. They're gonna, they gonna do fire me. Come on. All right. So, would you rather be in Roy's or be coked up? Listen, let's not listen. do that. Listen, I'm just throwing that out there. If you guys are, if we're going to throw, you know, different factors of who they play with and what they did and so on and so forth, that's a factor too. Is not is not steroids. It's not a performance enhancing drug or factor. Just throwing it out there. We're talking about who's the best now. It's probably it's probably a lot of guys that took steroids that still couldn't be the one. Either none of those players. That steroids shit don't mean nothing. Took some steroids that don't mean that's going to make you a player. That don't mean that. And I'm, I'm, that. I'm, not I'm not talking about I'm not talking about the difference between good and, and okay. I'm talking about the difference between the best and the best and the best. That's what I'm, I'm just and I'm not even making the judgment. I'm just saying I'm just saying well, what about those factors when you guys are talking about who who the best linebackers were? Uh, well I'm I'm glad you brought up steroids because what steroid running back have you ever seen a highlight of them running over Jack Lambert or Dick Buckers? Because I can get and Eddie George. I seen Eddie Eddie George Put 52 on his back twice. And I seen Ray run through him, too, and take the ball from him and all that. So what you mean? Dude, all I'm saying is it was a different, let's be honest, it was a different game back then. Dude, back then, there was one bell cow. He, Ray was seeing who, Eddie? Eddie was the big boy back then. Man, Dick Buckets and them seeing them, dude, they, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, What division did uh, Jerome Bettis is in, sir? Come on, man. All right, I'll give you the bus. I, okay, okay, okay. I mean, I'm just, I ain't saying he ain't playing no. I told you, raise three. Why the you man, raise three? The, the man won two, how many, deep, two, two defensive players of the year and, and, and one played on the best defense ever, 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 led that and won the Super Bowl, and won two Super Bowl. What else you want him to do? What else you want him to do? Jack, Jack did four of them. All right, so let's talk about this. Y'all name me one of them D, one of the D backs from the Steel Curtain. I'll wait, man. I can name the whole secondary from the Ravens. He didn't just have help up front; he had dudes in the behind him too. It wasn't huh? a error in the seventies. Oh, so that's what we going with. Okay. The game was in. They was running the rock a whole lot during that time too. When the Ravens was at their peak, that running game was different back then. They wasn't using two, three backs. Listen, it was, the backs was in motion into the slot. They, they, they gave up. They, they none of the team scoring them damn near the whole season. I'll bet. I, I bet. In the, in the offense, they were scoring more than the offense. But when you got <laughs> all the famers behind you and in front of you, and you looking up to the front office, y'all better not take these guys from around me. Yeah, I bet so. Okay. I'm trying to figure out what's your point. My point is, <laughs> Jack, Jack didn't even have that much help. Mike had, Jack, Mike had a safety. Okay. Mike what? Singletary had a safety. What? Come on, man. Jack, Jack didn't have no help behind him. Hold on. L.C. Greenwood, Joe Green, Jack Ham, Mel Blunt. You, you ain't got to. Mel Blunt. Okay. What, 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 you got to compare Ed right? Reed. <laughs> Listen to what you. Come on, man. You're going to compare those guys to... No, the, no, 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 pause, pause, pause. You're the one that said, you're the one that said that Jack Lambert didn't have anybody with him. I just named, I just named L.C. Greenwood, Joe Green, no, no, Jack no. Ham, Mel Blunt. I said he didn't have nobody behind him like Ray. Ray was, dude, the Ravens was good from top what position to bottom. Blunt, and they was bringing guys off the bench. And they would go to free agency and break, get dinosaurs. Hey, uh, hey, Dion, you want to get you another Dude, one real quick? I know what it is. Hey, uh, I, know, I know what it is. I know what it is. I know what it is. Dude, they was deep you over there. That was Mike, a layup. You the Mike Marks too much in the meetings when they uh, were watching the film and look, y'all looking at Ray talking about, oh, he ain't all. I know it. I already know. I already know. I already know. Uh, 
<laughs> all right, so hold on. Because yeah. you guys are going to be here all night going back and forth. Let's, let's just simplify one more time. Okay, just to make sure we leave this podcast with a definitive answer. Of all those guys you guys just named, okay, Arlen, who is the best linebacker of all time in your opinion? Best Jack middle linebacker. Lambert. Jack Lambert. Okay. Tommy, best one. Ray Lewis. Ray Lewis. Okay. There we go. So, hey, we called this Rams brawl for a reason, and they, <laughs> and that's our first first pretty knockdown. Folks, you can follow us at Rams Brawl on Twitter. You can follow Tommy at Tommy, where they can follow you at? T Pilot29. And Arlen? Arlen Harris. 33. Always messed up that underscore. Arlen Harris, 33, and also <laughs> at Train Run It. <laughs> Train Run It. You can follow me <laughs> on Twitter at DC Apollo. Folks, we are getting out there. The podcast is doing well. We've been getting lots of good feedback on. Please, please, please make sure you, you leave some feedback for us. You can go to Apple Music and leave a review on the show. And don't hesitate at all to let us know individually. You can always send us a message on, on Twitter. Just give your thoughts on on what we can do to make the show better or worse, <laughs> wherever you wherever you find it at. And we'll talk to you next week for the for the guys, for all of them. This is Derek C. Paul. We'll see you soon. We're out. <laughs>